We're here before you to present the ICWA um, press release for our press conference for um, the Navajo Nation people, our children, our families. So let me start with introduction. Let's start at the end. Luke chapter eight, the chapter, and I'm um, a Deneba Washington, the Agati Taitso Chinanish. My name is Ethel Branch. I'm the Navajo Nation Attorney General. Thank you for joining. Aro yate ano ten aro si hataso kizigido kwen kinanish di es chinias man hat enigido nle ah si yego slatin ha hot soigi na hoy na hoy ahe betaten di nil soz do benina chohot anegi ekwa edi ahwa man hat enigi hodoyet on junago pen kesin da hoy dil neto da hot hegido halit ola nasko na hot es jiro pena danit edo des ha nenegi Dr. Boo Nigren, um, so thank you everyone for joining. Many of you uh, are from the press and are familiar with the case. Um, the case is Holland versus Brackeen that was first filed when I was previously attorney general. Um, there have been many instances where um, right-wing advocacy groups have tried to uh, come after ICWA and um, have it ruled as unconstitutional. Um, and this was yet another one of those instances. Um, the, the last instance was the Carter case, uh, which we also litigated when I was attorney general for Navajo Nation. When this case first came out, I worked very hard to have the case dismissed, but unfortunately we were not the only tribe at issue uh, in this case with an interest. Um, and so uh, others decided to litigate the case. Um, so we were part of that litigation and worked very hard to defend ICWA in the courts. Um, the case arose out of Texas um, and the, the mother joined the um, adopting family, the, the Brackings in the litigation and challenging ICWA and actually has a second child, YRJ, um, for which we also have live litigation and we are the only tribe for whom that child is eligible for enrollment. Uh, so that we expect to see that case that has been stayed awaiting the outcome of this decision uh, to start picking up steam again soon in the federal courts. But with respect to this particular decision, we did have um, Coney Barrett authoring the decision. We're very, very pleased to see a 7-2 decision. We were not, I certainly was not expecting that. Um, and was very, very pleased with the outcome of that decision. Um, we had um, a uh, <laughs> very clean decision, in my opinion. When I was listening to the oral arguments, I was hoping that the conservatives on the bench would um, go ahead and kick some of the, the more um, challenging aspects of the case on the basis of lack of standing. And that is indeed what happened with respect to the equal protection question and whether or not ICWA um, is, is an unconstitutional uh, racial preference for Native Americans. So that question was not addressed in this case, thankfully. Uh, and we did have that 7-2 opinion. Um, and then the ICWA itself was affirmed as to its constitutionality. Um, the court drew on the Indian Commerce Clause uh, as a basis for Congress to have the authority to pass the Indian Child Welfare Act, which they did in 1978. Uh, and additionally, the court affirmed that they had constitutional authority to pass that act. Um, there was a strong reaffirmance of plenary authority with Congress with respect to legislating in the field of Indian law. Uh, so it was very heartening to see that from the bench. Um, <clears throat> additionally, the court ruled that 
Um, ICWA does not violate the anti-commandeering doctrine of the 10th Amendment. Um, so that also was very encouraging. So we just really have a couple more issues left to fully get that uh, validation of the constitutionality of ICWA. And we do expect, because there is such an aggressive effort um, by conservative think tanks to um, take down ICWA, uh, we do expect those challenges to start. And in fact, as I mentioned, with respect to YRJ, those are already underway. Um, so we, the fight to protect ICWA continues. Um, and here at Navajo Nation, at, with respect to the Department of Justice under the president's leadership, um, and that's a high priority. Uh, we already, one of the very first things I did as attorney general was pull together my legal team um, and discuss how do we strengthen the nation's um, implementation and utilization of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we did develop a strategy um, with my brother here, Mr. Thomas Cody, and his team as well. Um, so I'm very excited to, to have that um, being underway, and we might talk about that strategy a little bit more. Additionally, I've been in conversation with um, some folks who do some of the nation's equal litigation, um, and we have a strategy to be more aggressive in our equal litigation, particularly in certain jurisdictions. Uh, the Carter case arose out of Arizona. Most of our ICWA cases do arise out of Arizona. Um, and so if we intervene in those cases earlier, that'll give us a stronger starting position from a legal perspective to have control over where our children are placed. Um, one of the, the saddest things about um, the Brackeen case is the child at issue actually had a Navajo family uh, willing to adopt that child. Um, but because the Brackeens were so aggressive in their litigation, it, it scared that family away. Essentially, they weren't willing to um, go through the, the heartache and trial that would be associated with adopting um, the child at issue. Uh, and we're not prepared to wait three to five years for litigation to wrap up in order to bring that child into their family. So, um, you know, and then with the other child, YRJ, uh, we do have a family member that is willing to adopt that child. And so um, <clears throat> in any event, we are very much ready at the Department of Justice to continue full exercise of ICWA, to continue defending it, uh, take proactive measures to make sure that we are in a stronger position for future litigation. Uh, and with respect to YRJ, um, are, are ready to apply all the resources that are necessary to protect the Indian Child Welfare Act and our ability as a nation to, to protect our future to our children, um, not only our, the future of being able to pass on our language and culture and traditions, um, but also to continue um, our, our sovereign existence into the future through our children. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Really appreciate you being here and am thankful to the justices for uh, applying the law with respect to ICWA and ensuring that anyone presenting a question before the court actually has standing to do so. Um, so that does protect us and ICWA to ensure that, um, you know, to limit activism on the bench, um, to make sure that everybody's following the same rules um, when they present a question to the court. So, thank you. Okay, Madam AG, Adokdo. Can you guys hear us? I think our sound is a little poor. Can we have that fixed? Um, so, let's continue on. Um, Madam Speaker, are you able to come on? Madam Speaker? Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Is she on? I can hear you. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, is the audio good? We're good. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, um, everyone there, uh, Attorney General, and also our President, uh, Mr. Nygren, and also uh, Mr. Cody. Uh, 
I am joining um, the press conference here from Window Rock. Uh, you can, we are inside the council chambers this morning. I'm sorry, couldn't be there with all of you this morning. However, uh, we're celebrating still uh, this week the victory of our ICWA case at the Supreme Court uh, this past week. And I'm here uh, celebrating with many families throughout the Navajo Nation and celebrating our children. We always uh, say that in Navajo culture that our children are sacred and that they are the future. So this past week was a celebration and reflection on how we continue to protect each of our family members and our families and especially our children because we do see them as a connection between now, the past and the future and being able to uh, embrace our Navajo culture, our language and our children have that capability to secure that and to also continue to uh, pass that on from generations to generations. So we want to uh, thank all the Supreme Court justices that supported uh, the decision this past week, being able to recognize tribal sovereignty and being able to allow uh, Navajo parents being able to take care of their children and also Navajo uh, Indian and also Native American families to being able to uh, protect and given that chance to take care of our own children. And this has been significant, especially as a mother, you know, being able to provide for our children and being able to uh, being able to teach them our culture and our language and our values and our principles uh, as a indigenous being as an indigenous person and it was overwhelming with joy and a lot of our prayers were answered you know many of our past leadership has fought for this um, in this council chambers and within the capital of the Navajo Nation so we were very happy that our voices and our prayers were heard by the Supreme Court and being able to um, reflect that our children are always welcome home and that our children are sacred and our children are precious and that we want to be able to provide a safe community here within our tribal communities for them, being able to welcome them into our homes, being able to greet them through our friendship and our kinship and being able to love them and comfort them um, the way that our grandparents and our ancestors passed down to each and every one of us. So it has been a, a momentous uh, week for Indian country and particularly the Navajo Nation because it, it was just a, an overwhelming of joy to know that we have a chance to be in our children's lives. It, it may, we may not be in any relations, but through kinship, we are all related. Uh, through kinship, we are able to provide for our families. Through kinship, we are able to... Uh, unconditionally love a child, especially that is within our bloodlines, within our communities. And it just gives us that chance to celebrate together as a, as a whole nation and a, as a whole uh, family and throughout Indian country. So I just uh, thank you for giving me this time to reflect on this victory for Indian country and the Navajo Nation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, um, for providing those good words. Uh, Indian Child Welfare at Where does it apply? The Navajo Nation um, parents, the guardian will have to reside off the Navajo Nation. Indian Child Welfare Act. It's not a custody dispute. It's between the state and the Navajo Nation. So that's where the Indian Child Welfare Act applies. 
Um, it's originated by the state courts. Um, the uh, ICWA is also the interest of the child. Um, so it's actually returning the kids back to uh, the Navajo Nation or to the tribe that they belong to. So that's where ICWA applies. Um, how does a uh, ICWA start? It, I, it's either there's a call, a certified mail or email to the Navajo Nation or to uh, to the tribe. That's where how ICWA is generated. Uh, then we coordinate with the state courts to make sure that the child is in proper custody. We work with tribal rec record, vital records to make sure the tribe, the kid, the child is eligible for enrollment or they're enrolled with the, um, the, the, the Navajo Nation. If they're not enrolled, or not eligible for enrollment, they are not part of ICWA. So that's how um, ICWA is worked on the Navajo Nation. Madam Eiji? the president to offer a remark. <clears throat> Again, I think one of the main things I just want to kind of reiterate uh, on behalf of the Navajo Nation is that Let's continue to make sure that we're uh, doing what we can to really help and advocate for our children uh, and, and their time of need, because a lot of these kids probably really need a place to go. And on behalf of the Navajo Nation, we're always trying to figure out, making sure that we are looking into their best interests so that uh, we place them with Navajo families first. And so I know I've tasked uh, Mr. Cody over here to make sure that he does get a lot of these families ready and prepared to make sure that they can take a lot of these kids uh, into their own homes because there's a lot of kids that really need attention at this moment in time. So if we can uh, make sure that we're operating at that highest level so that we're making it easier on the kids, because that's the first and foremost about everything is how can we make it easier and make it a good process for these young ones? Because we don't, we don't ever want it to be a bad experience. So I think that's where we're really trying to make sure that we continue to implement ICWA. And I know the Navajo Nation has done a, a great job in, in, in that whole process. But now that we've um, secured this win, that we're going to continue to build upon our programs so that we can continue making sure that we're helping our young ones. So, again, I think that's my, my, my biggest statement is just really trying to make sure that we have a world-class process of make, going through the ICWA process to make sure that Navajo kids go in Navajo families and that they have a good, good experience throughout that, throughout that whole process. But as far as ICWA, as, as you all have heard on Friday, um, I think it was a big win for all of us, a big win for Indian country, because it definitely strengthens our sovereignty, strengthens our self-determination, it strengthens that we as a nation can make our own decisions on how and what we should do as, as a nation, especially the Navajo nation as well. So with that being said, I just want to say thank you. I also just want to talk a little bit about the background of ICWA, why we have the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, <clears throat> we, we have ICWA because of how um, our children have been used as a weapon um, and how schools have been used as a weapon to undermine tribal sovereignty and, and the continuation of indigenous nations in this country. Um, the boarding school system was developed in the late 19th century in order to kill the Indian, save the man, um, and essentially um, assimilate our children into white society so that we would know they would no longer have a, an indigenous mentality, um, would no longer uh, return to their families or their nations and would just disappear into the American fabric. Um, and so, you know, that legacy created the Indian boarding school system. And then from there, in the middle 20th century, um, the adoption of Native children became very popular. Um, and there were different programs, including for Navajo Nation, the Indian Student Placement Program. Uh, my aunts and uncles all participated in that. 
Um, it was great in many respects, but continued that dispossession of our children as Native people. Um, so I think it's really important that we be mindful of that history and the role that Congress had to exercise to stabilize Native families and ensure that our children couldn't just be taken from us and that we would continue to have a future as Indigenous nations. Um, so I just want to say very, very thankful to Congress in 1978 for ensuring that our children would no longer be pawns in this process of eliminating the existence of Indigenous nations in this country. Um, this was coming out of uh, an era in which tribes were being terminated outright. Um, so that's the other side of the, the edge of the sword of plenary power for Congress is Congress has the power to do great good uh, with plenary authority with respect to Indian affairs, but it also has the power to do great harm. Um, and thankfully, we currently exist in an era of Indian self-determination. Um, and we hope that that era continues. Uh, we do see that tribes have the greatest success across all spectrums, economic, social, um, if they are able to exercise greater sovereign authority um, and, and flex self-determination to the max. Um, so we hope that this trend will continue. Uh, we hope that um, ICWA will remain in place so that our families can, that can protect the integrity of our Native families and the integrity of our nations into the future. Um, so just wanted to add that additional perspective. Um, is there any additional thoughts before we open up the floor to questions? I don't have Madam Are you coordinating? Um, so we are now open for questions. Uh, we can, folks can either ask a question on um, the Zoom, raise your hand, and you can ask your question on a Zoom. Uh, this is a press conference, so on the live medium, Facebook, TikTok, we won't be taking questions on those forums. We'll be reserving questions for the press. Um, but if you raise your hand, you can ask your question live, or I believe some folks have also added their questions to the chat. Chris, do we have any questions, any hand raises at this time? Do we have any questions in the chat? Okay. okay. All right. Um, do any closing? So thank you. Thank you for joining us for our press conference, ICWA press conference. So we'll wrap this up with since there's no questions. Chris, one more time. All right. Thank you.